Chicago, magnificent hub of America's great Midwest, far-flung city of millions, ever-expanding, ever-growing. When Chicago was just growing up, traffic wasn't much of a problem. It about took care of it, and a horse-drawn streetcar was the only public conveyance those early Chicagoans knew. Handsome are not allowed on boulevards. Horse-drawn vehicles and cyclists were the problem. Far different this great day of today when vast numbers of people must ride to work, to school, to shop, and to play, often to far parts of the city. In growing up, the simple traffic problems of the infant city have become a veritable juggernaut of death, delay, and slow decay. To keep its proven place as one of the world's great cities, to put the I will spirit into dynamic action, Chicago proposes to have a modern, comprehensive, and unified transportation system, including not only subways, but superhighways, too. No traffic jams, no shrieking ambulance siren, no maimed children or pedestrians, and no blighted property is any part of these beautiful safety highways. The plan provides for building a 63-mile system of these superhighways to serve every part of Chicago. West, Northwest, Southwest, North, South, Southeast. A cross-town route will link them together and the superhighways, along with the elevated surface lines and subways, will give Chicago streamlined transportation second to none. While superhighways are in the offing, the first subways are actually under construction. It was a momentous day in Chicago history when Mayor Kelly and Secretary Ickes shared honors in breaking ground for the first subway. The time, December 17, 1938. Of the $46 million cost, $18 million comes from federal PWA funds and $28 million from the city's traction fund. Not a penny from taxes or special assessments against real estate. And subway construction does stimulate industrial activity and create new jobs, too. Altogether, it means millions upon millions of dollars in wages for workers not only on the job, but all over Chicagoland, producing and manufacturing the 101 materials that go to make up subway. Jobs in huge steel plants and foundries. Jobs in cement plants, working at full capacity. Jobs for men in mines and quarries. Barge loads of sand and gravel and other material. Jobs for men in transportation. Subway paychecks to be taken home to happy families. Yes, sir, step right up, boys. It's hard work, and this is the best part of it. These busy workers are skilled designers drawing the many intricate blueprints for subways and superhighways. Their plans include not only superhighways and the subways now under construction, but subway extensions as well. And here's the comprehensive subway program, starting with the two routes now nearing completion. Route number one, connecting with the South Side L near 14th Street, extends north in State Street, west in Division, and then in Clybourne to meet the North Side L near North Avenue. Route number two extends north in Dearborn Street from Van Buren, west in Lake Street, and then in Milwaukee Avenue to connect with the Logan Humboldt L near Polina. A west side subway clear out to Laramie Avenue and one in Lake Street to Racine Avenue are next on the schedule. And streetcar subways in Washington and Jackson from Clinton Street to Grant Park. Then a south and southwest subway in Wells Street and out Archer and Ashland to 79th Street and a northwest extension in Milwaukee Avenue to Foster. Later construction will add a South Park Avenue extension from the L to 79th Street. Crosstown subways on the near west side, subways in North and in Belmont Avenues, an extension to the airport, a Milwaukee Avenue Express subway, a Michigan Avenue connecting link. 
The part now being completed is seven and seven-tenths miles long. The master plan, not all for tomorrow, but as the ultimate objective, will provide a 54-mile subway system. This doesn't look like a subway, but it has more to do with it than you may think. Inside these wooden forms are the giant twin tubes through which the State Street subway train will run under the Chicago River. Made of welded steel plates, the great tubes are 200 feet long and lined inside and out with thick walls of concrete, more than 6,000 tons of it. Built in dry dock, the tubes are sealed airtight and watertight and floated up the Calumet River and Lake Michigan, 18 miles to the spot where they're to be submerged. Here in the Chicago River, the huge twin tubes are sunk and then joined to the subway at either end. This method permits placing the tops of the tubes only five feet below the bed of the river, whereas tunneling would require a greater depth to provide cover below the riverbed. Divers go down to check the accuracy of operations, for this is no simple engineering feat. Its success depends upon the care and skill of the men who are building the subway. The tubes must fit accurately into place between the subway sections on either side of the river. Subway trains will carry thousands of people beneath the river in perfect safety and comfort. But now let's watch some actual digging on the subway. Before going down into the deep tunnel work, here is an open cut job at Clyburn and North Avenue. And this is where trains will climb out of the subway and onto the elevated over gently sloping inclines. Open cut construction is simply digging a hole in the street to the desired dimensions. Earth and buildings are supported by steel sheet piling braced with cross beams. Finally, of course, the open cuts are roofed over solidly with steel and reinforced concrete of great strength. For in most instances, not only tons of earth, but heavy traffic as well must be supported. People still must ride even while the subway becomes a reality, so surface traffic is diverted around this open-cut excavation in Milwaukee Avenue without interruption of service. All underground utilities, water, sewer, gas mains, and electricity and telephone lines must do their usual work and are bypassed or hung over the excavation. Thousands of tons of concrete go into the walls and roof of the subway. In fact, a million tons of sand and gravel, a million barrels of cement, and over 135,000 tons of steel go into the initial subways alone. The job is done and normal streetcar traffic restored. You wouldn't imagine that this new pavement is hiding a subway, would you? But you'll be riding through it safely and swiftly. To provide plenty of fresh air for stations and the subway, air shafts are dug down from the surface at frequent intervals along the routes. Watch this now and don't let it make you dizzy. In addition, many ventilating fans will be installed. In the stations, fans will entirely change the air every 10 minutes. You can feel sure that the subway is well ventilated. Not only do engineers direct every step of underground operation, they also check carefully and continuously on the surface to make sure no damage is resulting from the work underneath. Safety is the watchword for the men who work below ground. One act of carelessness might endanger the lives of many, therefore, there is constant supervision of each man's personal safety. Each must pass a stringent physical test. Men trained in mine rescue methods are on duty at all times. Huge air compressors endlessly pumping air to maintain constant pressure in the tunnels. Like air in an automobile tire, compressed air helps support the earth walls and roof until steel and concrete can be securely placed. This air pressure alone supports approximately a ton of earth per square foot. In entering the tubes proper, workmen must pass slowly through a tightly sealed airlock where they are subjected to gradually increased air pressure. No, they're not practicing the Bronx cheer. They're equalizing the increasing pressure against their eardrum. One shift going in meets another coming out. For down here, 40 feet below the Earth's surface, men work night and day under this compressed air packing out huge hunks of tightly packed blue clay. It looks easy, but there's a knack to handling this tugger knife, powered by compressed air, and this skilled miner shows us how an expert does it. 
The power is on the other end of the cable. It's called an air tugger, and there's no time for signals. It takes close coordination and cooperation. The compressed air in the tunnel, along with all that human energy, creates terrific heat and humidity. Even these hardened miners and muckers are dripping with perspiration before they've worked more than a few minutes. The muckers toss the clay into waiting cars on the narrow gauge track. From there, it's taken to the surface and hauled away. As the earth is removed and the tunnel progresses, strong steel ribs are put in place to hold back the surrounding earth walls. For each tube must support the tremendous loads around and over it, and traffic in the street above. Steel liner plates are securely bolted to the ribs, forming a stout armor, which, with the concrete lining to be added later, is strong enough to resist any pressure. The steel work follows closely, never more than a couple of feet behind the mining. A dramatically different method of tunneling is used where ground is soft, buildings are large, and loads are heavy. This huge steel device is a shield pushing through the soft, oozy clay. Regulated at this sensitive control panel, hydraulic pressure is applied to drive the shield forward like a giant biscuit cutter, 25 feet across and weighing over 200 tons. Four of these shields, two in Dearborn and two in State Street, bore through the fluid-like soil underlying Chicago's central business district. Yet the thousands going about their work and doing their shopping on the ground above are virtually unaware that history is in the making beneath their feet. As the muck is squeezed like toothpaste through the openings in the shield, it is mined and loaded into industrial cars. Great steel ribs and plates are gripped by a hydraulic arm, hoisted into place and erected just inside the tailpiece of the shield. Here they form continuous rings of heavy lining, solidly bolted together. Each ring is almost a yard wide and weighs over five tons. The hydraulic jacks that force the shield forward shove against the edge of the ring of lining just placed. There are 24 of these jacks, and each has a shoving force of 125 tons. Some street settlement cannot be avoided, but there is never a chance for a real cave-in, for at every step, in addition to air pressure, the walls are supported either by the shield or by the steel lining. No matter how it's excavated, two million cubic yards of clay, an amount the size of a skyscraper 45 stories high and a city block square, must be hauled away. It's bumpy now, but before long, streamlined subway trains will glide smoothly through here over a splendid new roadbed. Hop on for a ride and we'll find out where all this dirt goes. The dump cars have to go through the airlock, for the lock prevents the compressed air in the tunnel from escaping. A section of track is removed to let the door shut tightly. And now we're all set. And here we are coming out the other end of the lock after the air pressure has been released. We're now in the drift tunnel, which connects with the outside world. But we're still 40 feet below street level. It's Lincoln Park, where clay from the subway contributes to the continuing development of Chicago's world-famed lakefront beauty spot and playground. And here's the new North Avenue Beach House, and a beach that accommodates thousands. Subway clay was used in building its foundation. 
subway clay also provides foundation soil for other public projects. There's more to building a subway than excavating dirt and putting in steel bracing. Next comes the reinforced concrete floor and walls to a thickness of two feet or more. Car loads of reinforcing steel are used. These rigid rods are placed by men who work with skill and speed. Countless rows of heavy steel reinforcing rods form a continuous network over which the concrete is poured for the walls and arch. Concrete is mixed in big machines on the surface. In open cut construction, the concrete slides down by its own weight. Where work is done under air pressure, the concrete must be forced by compressed air through pipes into the subway tubes, where it is handled by a placing machine. And here it comes. With the solid steel lining and the steel reinforced masonry that will last for generations, the subway will be collapse proof, even bomb proof. When the concrete reaches the placing machine, it is forced by pressure through a pipe into the steel forms where it hardens in final place. Pouring concrete for the floor is fairly simple. The concrete is agitated with a vibrator to compact it and form a dense solid and watertight mass. Experts give it the finishing touches by hand. And this part of the job is nearly done. Pouring the concrete for the arch is more dramatic. It's a tough job. The workmen inside the form dodge the concrete as it comes from the blower pipe with a reverberating roar. Don't mistake these construction cars and tracks for the real thing. A modern roadbed and cars and automatic block signals make subway riding more comfortable and safer than driving your own car. A loading station in the rough. Here the roadbed tracks, platform and finish are yet to be added. A mezzanine type subway station, as it appears when completed, is shown in this artist's sketch. Entrances are direct from the sidewalk, near all four corners of the intersection, eliminating crossing the street on the surface. Ticket offices, service and restrooms on the mezzanine level between the street above and the train platforms below. Both escalators and stairs provide access between the mezzanine and the loading platform. New all-steel subway cars will be supplied by the transit company. So a new Chicago is coming into being. Subways operating with trains like these. A unified and modernized surface system. Already some new equipment in use. Swift, easy starting and quick stopping streetcars. Smooth riding trolley buses. Combination gas and trolley buses. Buses of smart, modern design. Hundreds more of each scheduled for early delivery. And a city-wide network of superhighways. Here's a preview of the latest all-metal subway trains proposed for Chicago. Speedy and comfortable and stylish, too. Another notable achievement in promoting human as well as civic values for the I Will City. It's all aboard Chicago, city of friendly communities for a richer neighborhood life. Thank you.